This episode is brought to you by Canopy. Canopy Canopy.us backslash classical. Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. My name is Thomas Magby. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. A.J. Hannenberg. That's me. And Mr. Graham Donaldson. Hello. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. This is your favorite podcast about old stuff and books. That's, yes. Do we oh, talk about anything man. other than books? So, we already made this joke last time. It's quite a statement. That we only talk about books? No, that we are your favorite podcast. We are your number one favorite podcast, or else. This hmm. is a threat. Hmm. Is that clear? I guess so. Uh, today we are going to be... Yes, sir. What? You guess so? No, I said yes, sir. No, thank you. Much appreciated. I am the dictator of this podcast, Thomas Magby. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about um, Gates. We're going to keep talking about Gates. More Gates. We're going to be talking about... Bill Gates. We're talking about Bill Gates. I got the virus vaccine. Yeah, I, I was going to say I got the virus, and I was like, we need <laughs> to end virus. this episode. We need to go home no, now. I got the vaccine. The virus. My 5G connection in my brain is crystal clear. It's so really nice. I've been tele- mm-hmm. telepathing with you yeah, yeah. all morning. Kind of we have been streaming all sorts of things during your last episode. Thank and you. That's why y'all were so quiet YouTube. the whole time. Yeah, that's good. I I'm <laughs> glad y'all at least entertained during my episode Back for episodes once. of yeah, Friends. Good. Yeah, it's wow, good. Nice. Uh, wonderful. Well, Somebody yeah. told me that life was going to be Please don't get us taken down. Wait, no, hold on. Wait, no. Stop. No, this is horrible. YouTube, Sorry. you're going to love getting to see that clap. Hey, also, I should say this. I complained about this last time um, AJ did an art episode, but I actually did put that art episode up on YouTube, and it mm-hmm. includes all the pictures, and mm-hmm. we're planning on doing that again for Thomas, this you're a saint. I am mm-hmm. a saint, so I look forward to being... Uh, so if you're driving in your car, if you're know. going to work right now, you may want to pull over uh-huh. and watch this on YouTube. Oh, no, no. You can just, just grab your phone. Just go to YouTube right now. You don't need to pull over. No, no, don't no. do that. Wait, no. Oh, sorry. Hold you on. Guys, I usually just tape it to my steering wheel, uh-huh. and it works really well, uh-huh. except that the, the horn gets on people's nerves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when, you're, when you're like pausing the video? No, it's honking <laughs> the horn the whole time. Oh, yeah, yeah, the one, once you put it on, yeah, it's out. really obnoxious. Um, speaking of obnoxious, this is a great intro. So, uh, um, AJ, do you want to take it away with the discussion sure. of Gates? So, t- today we are talking about more Gates, in specific large doors. Last time... <laughs> that's what a gate is. What do you... Well, there's a, I mean, there's also small doors that are Gates. Like Garden Gate. The Garden Gate. Mm. Right. No, I, I, that's actually a good question. What no, no, is no, a door no, gate? No, no, no. Is a hot dog no. a gate? Is a, All right, so last time we talked about the Gates of Paradise, which are a very famous sculpture way back in the day off in Florence and were pretty influential in the art world. It was one of the first instances of relief sculpture using the laws of perspective, which would grow over the following centuries to be much more complicated than they, you know, than they were originally. But they were famous it was, gates. It was really beautiful. They were My famous. mom had never heard of those gates. Oh, wow. There's some nice gates. That's famous. Good. Yeah. Wow. There's some nice Are gates. we talking about, are these famous, the ones we're talking about today? These, these gates are made relatively recently uh in compar- in comparison to the older gates the older gates you know way back in the day in florence during the renaissance these gates are far more recent uh they are still older than 100 years right <laughs> so these um, qualify yeah. for the podcast Good, that's wonderful. all i'm saying is, is that, that the that definition 100 over 100 years, years old yeah, unlike i try to keep it simple for Good myself for and that's why i read things like one floor of the cuckoo's nest from the 60s <laughs> yeah, which clearly well qualifies Good. anyway so i'm <laughs> That's hard, awesome. audible eye roll from <laughs> yeah, Donaldson. Yeah. I get to hear it from over here, like a bowling alley. <laughs> um, anyway, so we, today we are talking about almost a response of sorts by a future sculptor named Francois Auguste René Rodin. He's from, the, he's from the future. This is a- after after the oh, you know the old gates. Like, yeah, they're newer find, gates. I want to find out he's a time traveler or something. This is right. Fun. So so you would probably just know him as Rodin. Everybody uh-huh. just kind of calls him you know by his last name because it's shorter. Right. So here's here's how we're going to go about the podcast, right? Just to give you a lay of the land. I, I was listening to some back episodes of ours and I realized that I don't often say where we're going. And so I can I can only imagine that our audience just has no idea what's happening for most of the time. So here's what's going to happen. Okay. I'm going to tell you about Rodin and his life, right? And then I'm going to tell you some, about some a few of his, of his other famous works that okay. sort of t- in, get entangled with his life. And then I'm going to introduce you to the Gates of Hell, which is the wow. the topic of this episode, and honestly, my favorite sculpture of all time. Wow. I think, still so far, I think it's still my favorite. And it is it is breathtaking. You can see it in a variety of places. That might seem weird, but I'll explain why. It is not in just one single place. So you can go see it almost wherever you live, even if you happen to live in the East. I think there's a version in Tokyo. Hmm. I think there's also one in Germany. There's a f- couple in the United States you can find. So they're just replicas of it. All over They're the castings. Oh, cool. Yeah. So they, I mean, they are Rodin's. Uh-huh. I don't know. They, 
any any casting you will find is done post posthumously, right? Mm, it true. was never cast during his lifetime. Sure. That's cool. So, but you can still go see it. So I will introduce you to the sculpture itself, and then I'll talk about a few figures on the sculpture as they relate to things we have discussed on this podcast before. Okay. So let's talk about Rodin. He was born in 1840, and he died in 1917 at the ripe old age of 77. That's pretty solid for uh, for a sculptor. And three years before the cutoff. <laughs> For whether this is classical mm-hmm. or not, thank uh, you. Well four. done. Four. Yeah, we are. In <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. One. that's right. It's we left twenty twenty. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was November, so mm-hmm. really like three, yeah, three and sure, a half. Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, he he lived to a decent old age, which is impressive. A lot of people that work with clay consistently in their lifetimes uh, sometimes suffer from lung problems because the particulates really? don't dissolve in the lungs. Yeah, I I do pottery on the mm-hmm. side, and right. this is one thing you always have to watch out for: is good ventilation because you're just risking. Like breathing it in and caking it up until you're toast. It's bad. He was born into the working class, the second child of Marie Schaeffer and Jean-Baptiste Rodin, who worked as a clerk in the police department. Uh, he started drawing at age 10 and attended the Petite École, the little school, <laughs> a school that specialized in art. At 17, he tried to pursue his artistic bent into a school called the École des Beaux-Arts, the, the school of beautiful arts. Beautiful arts. And his clay model was rejected. So he tried again and got rejected again. Dang. And then he tried again and got rejected again. And the worst thing about this is getting into the school was pretty easy. Oh, so no. this was, a, <laughs> this oh, was no. a big setback right. as far as he was concerned. But it's probably a good thing because the school was neoclassical. You guys know what that is? Neo- neoclassical? New classical. Yeah, I mean, it was focused on the techniques and the stories of the classical world, sure. much as this podcast is. In fact, we would probably be considered almost neoclassical, except we aren't still creating <clears throat> arts in the old style. I mean, we teach girls. Would that be yeah, a, a difference? I mean, there, there are big changes. Yeah. So it was the neoclassical style, and not being admitted to this school meant that he pursued some... I don't know, some of the newer art styles, and that's what gave him sort of his distinctive style and set him apart from other sculptors of the day, like Carpeau, who we will see a Carpeau, a Carpeau later in the in the podcast. Are they uh, rivals? No, oh. I don't think so. Right. I'm not even sure they lived at the same time. I know that one of his his sculptures was kind of influential in this and, re- and references some of the same material. Uh, I think they were contemporaries, but... We need rivals. We need, like, artistic rivals. In our lives or yeah, yeah, for the podcast. story of this podcast? like a rival podcast. Uh, okay. Joe Rogan. <laughs> you guys didn't know that? I get hate mail from Joe all, all the, time. the time. Yeah, he's really got to stop that. Yeah. So, Joe, if you're listening to this, stop stop the harassment, Yeah, man. AJ, why don't you lose weight? <laughs> Dang. I'm just trying to be Joe Rogan. All Thank you. Like, Ouch, bro. It's getting harsh. Okay. At the ripe old age of 22, his sister died and he was overwhelmed with guilt. He had introduced her to a bad boyfriend, an unfaithful lover. I'm not sure if that had anything to do with her illness. Uh, Has everything to do with the illness. Mm. In any case, he turned away from art and decided to join the Congregation of the Blessed Sacrament. He was going to become a religious man. Wow. The founder, however, was a, a wise man. He was a wise Catholic and said, this is a bad idea, my brother. You are not suited for the life of a priest. Wow. And you have artistic talent, so maybe you should try giving that a shot. So he kind of turned him away and encouraged him to pursue his arts. So he returned to art and he took some classes from a guy who sculpted animals. And this would actually have a pretty big influence on his art in the future as well, as Animals are often best sculpted in some sort of dynamic pose, right? They are attacking, they're running, they're doing something. Something, That's something about sculpting animals. You don't want like a lion lying lying down. I mean, I've seen those, uh, notably the big sculptures in Trafalgar Square. Oh, but that lion looks noble. Oh, kind of. It's also half dog. Did you know that? I did not know this. The lion lion sculptures in Trafalgar Square, if you give them a quick Google, the front half was modeled off from the carcass of a a lion, but the lion was decaying so quickly that he couldn't finish the sculpture by the time the lion was essentially Mm. decomposed. Yeah. So he finished the model with a dog. Mm. I think it was his dog. He just, so if you look at the back legs of the lions, (laughs) they are very clearly big old dog legs that are sitting there and not lion legs at all, which is really fun. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. At 24 years old, he started living with a seamstress named Rose Bure. She was a 20-year-old, and they became lifetime companions. Okay. Even though Rodan was not always the most faithful and did some romantic wandering and had a few escapades, 
he was a priest was right. He was of the artistic <laughs> temperament. And yeah, exactly. That was a wise priest. He knew, yeah. he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Uh, they had a son, Auguste Eugene Bure, who outlived his dad by only 17 years. Mm-hmm. In 1866, he offered his very first sculpture for exhibition and entered the studio of a fellow named Albert Ernest Carrier Belleuz, a mass producer of art objects. And in fact, on one of those links I sent you guys, so for, my, for our listeners, I to help my co-hosts through this, I sent them a large list of links to things. The first Oof, link sure is, a, <laughs> is a, a whole bunch of pictures of his works. Uh-huh. If you scroll way down, there's a series of busts. Mm-hmm. And one of them, I think it's in white marble, is this teacher of his. He's got a big old mustache and a necktie. He looks kind of noble, like a little, little jacket there. What's the name again? Albert Ernest Carrier Belleuse. So Albert, search for Albert. There it is. He, that's a wonderful mustache. I wish I could. Oh, yeah. Cool. That's a look. Right? Isn't that a great bust? That, that's, yeah. a, that's a look right there. So remember the... Man, we need ties like that. Right? It there's was nothing, a good look. I feel you. like fashion has regressed since mm-hmm. the 1800s. They had, some, they had some good clothes going on. Men looked nice. Anyway, so remember the technical prowess of that bust. Okay. It's, it is it's technically good, impressive right? yeah, and very good. lifelike, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's, he's no slacker. He can do the good things. So this is his boss, uh, Albert Ernest Carrier Belleuse, and he was a mass producer of art objects, right? He was all, so Rodin became his chief assistant until 1870, hmm. de- designing mostly like art, architectural embellishments, like, mm-hmm. you know, tops for columns and that, that sort of stuff, hey, stuff to go in archways. Columns aren't going to top themselves. Uh, true. True. And... At one point, they just, they got hired to work on the stock exchange in Brussels in Belgium. So he went to Belgium, and he was planning on only staying there for a few years, but he ended up staying there for six years wow. without Rose or his son, mm. right? So he is away from those he loves. Eventually, the relationship with Belouz kind of got on the rocks, and he separated from his boss, mm. and Rose decided to move to Brussels where he had some sculptures, but not really enough money to cast them in bronze, right? You could sculpt in clay, cast it, uh, put it into plaster casts, and then you would exhibit those with the hopes that somebody would say, hey, I want that, I'm going to pay for it, have it cast. Gotcha. Right? right, and that was kind of the practice of sculpture back then. Mostly make it in clay or something, put it in a plaster, hopefully you'll get it cast. Yeah. So at 35, he decided to visit Italy for two months, and the work of Michelangelo especially affected his work. Right? And it kind of freed him from all this academic sculpture that he was doing. So when he returned to Belgium after this long sojourn into Italy, he began work on what would eventually be called the Age of Bronze, considered one of his better early sculptures. And you can actually look that up. That it's is right the there. first link I sent you. Yeah. Okay. Oh. How, would, how would you describe this Age of Bronze fella? There's a guy um, standing there. He has one arm up. There's an elbow opponent pointed forward and like, I don't know what he's doing with his other hand. Is he? It's about to sing. Oh, is no. that what's about to happen? Well, originally it was called, I think, The Vanquished and he was holding oh. a spear. I was going to guess bow, but yeah, yes. Yeah. So like, it looks like there should be some kind of weapon. Oh, I see. Where, yes. So where he was vanquished or he's be. doing the vanquishing? vanquishing. I think he, he was vanquished. He looks pretty. Oh, really? he, does, he looks a little forlorn. Is he being stabbed? No, I think he was just holding the spear, but oh. you should note that Rodan didn't like the way that the spear obscured his torso, which oh. he was really proud of, uh-huh. and so he removed the spear, and That's so funny. now it just looks like a guy with a weird fist, yes. and his head, head up, his hand up, and this was influenced largely by a sculpture called The Dying Slave by mm. Michelangelo. I didn't send you a picture of that, but if you're curious, you can Google it really fast. Mm. Um, people didn't really like it very much. And I can tell you why. So he started Age of Bronze, life-size figure, very naturalistic, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not impressionistic at all. It looks like a human. Looks like a dude. Like, like right. a dude, right? People accused him, I, I keep on forgetting this word, of surmoulage, which essentially means he didn't sculpt this. Oh, he, he just took casts he just of like, people. What? Just took a dude. And- like he just took a dude, put plaster on his leg, pulled it off, and then. Is that, that's what he did? That was not what ah, he did. He was he, he was so good that it looked like he had done these casts instead of... Yes. Wow, that's incredible. They, they accused him of just bringing in somebody and then doing plaster huh. casts of the person and then casting that in bronze. Pretty and in fact, this influenced him and he was so frustrated by this that many of his future sculptures are either a little bit larger than lifelike that's funny. or a little bit smaller than lifelike so he can never be accused of this Stick again. Stick it to the man. Yeah, just to <laughs> show him that he, could, that he could get it done. Yeah. 
so yeah, he was accused of this. He actually brought in a a bunch of sculptures or a bunch of sculptors to kind of exonerate him, have them all check it out and look close and see if it was surmoulage mm-hmm. or not. And they exonerated him, but the nobody once the rumors out there yeah, yeah once the rumors out there and it's still kind of like the the critics didn't really like it some thought it looked like a sleepwalker mm-hmm. some called it an an astonishingly accurate copy of a low type oh. it was bought at cost Ooh. so Ooh. the sculpture was bought for what it cost him to cast it in bronze so yeah. not even really at cost right no cost no for his time right just just for the bronze yeah right so like, he didn't actually make not any paid money. for the time right. not paid for the clay not paid for the plaster that's yeah. rough yeah so he moves back to Paris at 37. All right, you guys tracking with me? Am I moving too fast? No, we're you tracking. got it. <clears throat> and he rented a small flat on the left bank. His mom was dead. His dad was blind and senile, being cared for by his sister-in-law, who was also caring for his now 11-year-old son that he hadn't seen in six years. He never really had a good relationship with his son. And then it was during this time that he kind of started wandering romantically. And, you know, his his sculpting career was on the rocks. He had put out the Age of Bronze and everyone had accused him not only of cheating, but of just kind of sucking in general. And so he sought solace in women. And he he earned his living during this period collaborating on public commissions. So another artist would get hired to make a sculpture for some sort of public thing. And he would help to make that sculpture. And during this time, he worked on studying art and his next sculpture, St. John the Baptist Preaching. So I also sent you a link of this. Can you describe to me the St. John the Baptist Preaching? Um, it's a man who is, uh, one hand is sort of held up in, almost like he's like describing something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one is, looks like it's pointing at his foot. Right. Yep, um, I got and, thighs there right here. <laughs> and <laughs> he's exactly looking off into the distance, and he looks like his mouth is like half through a sentence. Looks like he's talking. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's pretty jacked, St. John the Baptist. Yeah, bro is shredded. Yep. Yeah, I mean, he lives in the desert, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. it makes sense. He's, he's been eating nothing but honey. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that diet will, if nothing else will get you shredded, that'll, yeah, yeah. that will. That's like, I mean, it's uh, a lot of sugars, I guess. Mm. Yeah, the locusts balance it out. <laughs> it's all protein. It's enough protein. Um, right? And he's, but he's also not wearing anything except for a a leaf that a is fig strategically leaf, a strategically placed fig leaf. Yeah. Okay. Is, do you notice anything weird about his legs? Are they kind of big? Is that the thing you were saying before? Mm. He's he's walking funny. Yeah, he's, he's kind of walking funny. Is he? Yeah. It looks like he's sort of lumbering forward. Yeah, notice that the heel on the back foot is still oh, flat to the ground. Yeah, yeah. Right? He's supposed to be in that moment of transferring weight between his back leg and his front leg, right. but his back leg hasn't lifted hasn't at all. Hasn't lifted up yeah. yet. So it looks like he's just sort of stomping funny. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is partially because he modeled this sculpture on an Italian peasant who had a weird idiosyncratic way of mm. moving that he wanted to capture that looks kind of weird and dynamic and it, it did pretty good. It finished third. So he, he wanted John the Baptist to kind of look like a little that. lumbery, a little awkward. Yeah. Like he looks a little awkward. Dynamic human movement, right? Yeah. And I, I can't get over, it just looks like somebody being like, hey, bro, come here. I got something to tell you. And he's going to tell you some weird scam. That's mm-hmm. what it looks yes. like. It mm-hmm. looks like he's about to scam me. Yeah. So it doesn't have like the dignity you might expect yeah. from St. John the Baptist, right? Right. From a from a sculpture of St. John the Baptist, what you would probably expect is some sort of grand spiritual yes. nobility. But yes. that's not what you get. You get sort of a, well, a weird lumbering human. Exactly. If, he, if he's a weird dude in the desert. Yes. And that's why I think this is such a great sculpture, right? I feel like this might be what I, he actually looked like. Hmm, just, except no dreadlocks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's not wearing. He's he, he's just got. Uh, he's got. He's, I mean, he's got beautiful curly hair. Yeah. The original John the Baptist had dreadlocks. He'd probably have like or matted. You know. He had matted hair. Yeah. True. But uh, and probably some sort of cloak. Um, but you're right. He does. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, the the lo, the what is it? Camel hair. Yeah, sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But this John the Baptist, he does kind of look like he's sort of awkwardly lumbering forward. Yes. F- you know. Yeah. So if you saw that guy in the desert, you'd be like, that guy's a weird. That guy's a wacky prophet. That's what that guy is. Yeah. Fellas. The intellectual life is a worthy pursuit. But in the modern world, there are lots of distractions. I mean, the internet is literally a machine that is dedicated to stealing our attention. That's hard to, uh, to keep the intellectual life if you've got something that is constantly uh, stealing your attention. There's been tons of apps that have, out, that have come out that, are, that block websites or limit restriction to websites. But this new app called Canopy, which is a sponsor for today's episode, is awesome. Not only uh, can it block entire websites uh, that are big time sucks like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
Um, but if you're a parent, it can also block explicit content uh, for your student. Uh, if you're a school, uh, it's something that can not only just block entire web pages, but it can block partial web pages. So if there is uh, a web page that has worthy content but has questionable advertisers, uh, Canopy can block that stuff out. Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's great. And, and the vast majority of Canopy's use case scenario is on mobile because uh, studies have shown that most teenagers now interact uh, with questionable and explicit content on their phones. I remember when I used to teach out of school a bunch of years ago, we tried to do one of these like first generation website blockers and kids could get around it in like 30 seconds. Um, and, uh, uh, but with Canopy, um, uh, there's, uh, the parental controls of it are, uh, are top notch. Um, uh, there is the parental app and then the app that goes on the phone. Students can't, uh, can't get around it. They can't access web pages through like Google Maps, which is even a thing that you can do. Uh, they've thought of everything to make sure that any kind of uh, front-facing or any kind of like web browsing application is going to have Canopy integrated with it. And um, you guys that listen to our podcast, you can go to canopy.us backslash classical and you can get 30 days for free and up to 20% off forever. So if you sign up, you get 20% discount forever. That's great. So canopy.us, that's canopy with a C, dot US backslash classical for 20 days free and 20% off forever. Yeah, weird wacky prophet wanted to tell me something crazy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even be, it doesn't even look like he's looking at the person that he appears to be beckoning. Mm -hmm. Like he's saying here, come here while I'm looking somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's kind of strange. So again, the critics didn't really like it, but it did finish third out at a Paris salon. So he's doing okay. He's getting there. But not great. He's on his way. So at 40 years old, uh, Carrier Belouz, remember his his Mm one-time boss in Brussels, sort of offered him an olive branch. It was kind of to heal the relationship, right? And in the form of a part-time position in the National Porcelain Factory. And he took it. And his work was really good in vases and table ornaments, and it brought him some fame. So even though he's making these beautiful full-person sculptures Mm -hmm. like this... Some of what kind of helped his rise to fame was just super solid porcelain vases that he was making. So he started getting invited to Paris salons Uh and he started to meet really important people, including the undersecretary of fine arts in France, Edmund Turquay. And through his connections, won some pretty important commissions, which one of which was at 1880, at the age of 40 years old, the commission to create the door for the Museum of Decorative Arts. And this was what would later become the gates of hell. He did not complete it that year. Hmm. He did not complete it in the next 37 years. He died prior to completing it, but he would, he would work on it for the rest of his life. And it would be sort of a man, a reservoir for creativity. Half the stuff he created in his later life was originally a figure to be put on the door. And then he'd be like, "Wow, that's pretty good. And then Mm. he would just simply blow it up into a larger version Mm. and sell that off. And I'll I'll talk about some of those figures as we, as we move on. Hmm. It, that commission bought him a free studio and essentially artistic freedom, right? It's a huge commission. And so now he can kind of, kind of do what he wants. And he is finally working and making a living solely from private commission in 1883 he met an 18-year-old girl named Camille Claudel. Uh You can kind of see where this is going. They formed a... Apprenticeship? Yeah. Well, (laughs) apprentice and model. Uh She modeled for him, and he likes to sculpt the human form. And what you are imagining essentially happened. So he's, he's 43 years old, she's 18, and they kind of have this whirlwind, stormy love affair where she is learning from him and sculpting, and he is sculpting her and helping him, and she's working as at as his assistant. However, he still has not broken ties with mm. his other more stable lover, the right. his the mother of his child, right? They are still together. In fact, he would write that letters to Rose. her and say, like, I can't believe you're so patient with me. Bruh. I am still affectionately yours, Rodin. Ugh. But he was living in a different city. I think at this point they're both living in Paris. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's Rose, is that? Yep, okay. Rose. Yeah. He got other commissions during this time. One was a monument for Balzac that was heavily criticized, and he did one called the Burgers of Calais. We'll talk about those in a little bit. I'm not going to go too far into them now. Okay. In 1898, at the age of 58 years old, he and the young Claudel finally parted. So, man, how many years is that? That's what? 
15 years long time that they had that relationship going Mm -hmm. she suffered what was called a nervous breakdown and exhibited like crazy paranoia she destroyed a bunch of her artworks i think she even accused him of a whole of a whole bunch of things and then some people claim that she was exhibiting elements of schizophrenia Mm. and she was institutionalized by her family specifically her brother wow even though she kept on pleading that she was not crazy. Oh, wow. And then after being institutionalized for a while, the doctors told the brother, hey, she's not crazy. Like, she's okay. Right. And then time would pass, and they would recontact the brother and say, hey, man, you should maybe try reintegrating her into the family. She seems okay. You need to start trying to put her back into society. He always refused. He would speak of her in the past tense as if she was already dead. And then she was buried on the grounds that she had tried so hard to dis- to escape. She was institutionalized for 30 years wow. and eventually died. Wow. That is a tragic tale. It's horrible. Right? That sucks. That's yeah. that's not a good thing to happen to a promising young sculptress. And her stuff is good. She got really famous for a bust of Rodin that she really? made. Wow. Yeah. He got a big old bushy beard. Mm. I feel like he'd have been fun to sculpt. <laughs> he looks very grave and wild and wooly. Okay. So he got famous. By the year 1900, when he was about 60, he was doing busts of famous people, some of which you saw in that little list, and probably making around 200,000 francs a year, which Dang. is Tell a me. ridiculous like sum a lot, for that right? time period. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. And he had a lot of followers, including Oscar Wilde. He hosted guests at his expensive villa outside Paris, including King Edward. Oh. Uh, in 1908, he returned to the city from his his little villa outside Paris and started an affair with a duchess that I imagine was much younger. He gained followers in the States after a, a friend of his helped get some of his nudes over there and then displayed them, except, you know, we're kind of prude in America and we didn't like mm-hmm. having nudes on display. So they actually set up a big sheet Did over they? it and then you had to get special permission <laughs> to enter go. and That's look funny. at his sculptures. But it kind of opened up the American market to right. him. And then he also got into the British market. In his later years, he did, he kind of leaned into the whole human form thing and Mm. did a lot of nudes, a lot of erotic drawings. And some of them were even weird, fun, no look drawings. Do you know no no look drawings? Nope. So it's where you look at your subject, you put the pencil on the paper, and then you draw without ever taking your eyes off your subject or lifting the pencil from the paper. Oh. So he, he did a bunch of these. And when... Were they he, good? That sounds. I, I, I guess. Okay. Uh, he married Rose in 1917. Okay. The same year he died. Oh. <laughs> they were married for a year, and he died from the flu at his villa in the oh, outskirts really? of Paris. The flu? The like, flu, like influenza. Wow. And the thinker is placed next to his tomb. And you can find versions of the thinker all over all the over. place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll actually talk about the, the statue of the thinker and how that gets reproduced. And it's, it's kind of all over, but one is next to his tomb. And he willed his studio and his artworks to the French state and oh. gave them permission to make casts. So as far as I understand, That's still why. today, the yeah. French state can just be like, here's another Rodin and just kind of make another one. Right? Which is kind of great. It is. Okay. So that's Rodin. Any comments or questions or? Nope. Sounds no. like an artist. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, not, it's not, a very like, yeah. standard artist life. Not like a, not a great guy, but um, made good art, right? Yeah. Made yeah. real good art. Okay, let's talk about those two sculptures that I promised to talk about and didn't. The Burgers of Calais. I love this sculpture. It's actually my computer background. Really? Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. This one's your computer background? He's proving it right now. What? Was it already before this? (laughs) Oh, okay. No way. I I can't believe that. I didn't know you liked this sculpture. Oh, yeah. I love the story. Oh, great. Well, then can you... Well, actually, there are three links to to different versions of it that you can look at. I like the second one because it gets kind of close to the the faces of these guys. So Graham, can you do me two favors? Yes. One is describe to me the sculpture. And then second, if you know the story, would you tell it? So the sculpture is, um, from knowing the story, it's a bunch of men who are in rag, rags for clothes and they're wearing nooses around their necks um, and they are looking real sad. Um, they are in mourning um, and they are all, one of them's holding his head in his hands. One of them's like, holding his hands up in despair. A couple of them have hands down their side. One guy's got like a thousand yard stare. He's just staring into the distance and they look defeated and sad. Um, Because the story of the Burgers of Calais is 
Um, King Edward the Third, King of England. This is in like the what the thirteen thir- hundreds during the Hundred Years' War. During the Hundred Years' War, so this is probably like I don't know thirteen something. Um, he, uh, king Edward the Third is uh, thinks you know he wants to be the king of France because the Plantagenet dynasty traces their lineage to France, and he is besieging the town of Calais, which is in the north of France. Um, actually, is it technically now in Belgium? I can't remember. Um, but he's in the north of France. His queen, um, Queen Philippa of Hainault, um, is Belgian, essentially, if you were talking about modern modern day. And so he is besieging this town, and he's going to take it, and he's starving them. Everybody in the town, like, he has besieged it, and they are running out of food. And He's essentially um, said he's going to kill everybody. He's going right. And he's like, I'm going to kill everybody in this town. And... Um, uh, at some point, he convinces. He says, "If you can give me the burgers of Calais, the burgers are the like um, the town leaders, sort of like important. People yeah, the in important town. people of the town is like if you bring if they can if they come out and surrender, I'll kill them, and I will uh, spare the town. I think is maybe how it goes. But anyway, the the burgers of Calais, who would have been wealthy men." dress themselves up in sackcloth. They come out. Well, he required that they not have shoes or hats on. Oh, there you go. So he requires it. They come out with nooses around their neck with sackcloth, and they come out um, basically as a sacrifice for the town. If if King Edward kills us, he'll spare the rest of the town. And, you know, because it's just the villagers, they're not to blame. Kill me instead. And so they come out in deep mourning and wailing and lamentation, and all the town's like, you know, oh, man, these guys are great. And then they come to the king, and the queen um, uh, has pity on the burgers of Calais, throws herself at the mercy of the king, and I can't remember if he kills them or not. I don't think he does. I think he spares them. He spared them. Do you yeah. know why the queen asked for them to be spared? She's from that region. She's pregnant. Oh. And she thinks it'd be a bad omen for her unborn child oh, there you go. to have these six fellas killed. Oh, okay. Right? The other... The other fun thing is that he made this sculpture, and if you look at it, everyone is in sort of a different state of feeling, right? Mm. right? It was, each one is feeling different things. There's the guy that you are looking at on the far right who's putting his heads in his hands. Like, mm-hmm. he's clearly not having a very good time. Mm-mm. And then the one just to his left seems Stoic. determined yeah, yeah, yeah. to yeah. face this with honor and bravery. He's got like a Cato-like countenance. Yeah, the two on the far left seem to be having a conversation about how do we get out of this, but we can't. We have to go. Yeah, yeah. Right? Everyone is reacting to it with some sort of different psychological mm. problem. Yeah. Right? And when Rodin made this, he wanted it to be displayed at eye level where the public could kind of just bump into it in a crowd, right? And get really up close to these guys and see what they're feeling and seeing what they're going through. And they're all sort of holding the keys to the city, right? Mm. And oh yes, they have. Yeah, good. Uh, from what I that. understand, this was not well received. Really? He was supposed to make it for Calais, and they were. It, but he, does it? Mm, he wanted to maybe they wanted it romantic. That's the story. They wanted romanticized. romanticized. They yeah. wanted to be a united front of people nobly giving their lives for the city. And what he showed was men in despair <laughs> walking to their deaths. It's probably right. a much more accurate depiction of their feeling. Mm-hmm. Right, but. They they weren't very fond of this, and so they did exactly what he didn't want and put it on a huge pedestal oh. where the <laughs> with a railing in between where the audience couldn't really see it or get to it. And only after his death was it displayed in the way that he wanted it to be displayed, which mm. was far lower. All right, so that's the Burgers of Calais. It's, it's great. A, it's, it's a, a great wonderful sculpture, sculpture. Mm-hmm. and the the figures are enormous, right? They're I mean enormous. They're they're about life size, mm-hmm. right? They're like real people. Yep. Okay, the next one is Balzac. Kind of the same thing. It was supposed to be a memorial for a writer. And he he had several different <laughs> versions. Some with a coat. Looks like a vampire. He, yeah. he really does. <laughs> this, <laughs> is this real? Nah. That's real. That, that, is, okay. that is a sculpture he of him. He looks puffy. Yeah. He doesn't look, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for my audience, can you describe what this guy looks like? A triangle? You no, can't, yeah. Right. He, you can't see his bodily form. Right. He looks, looks like, like he's wrapped in a, like a Snuggie. It's like lumpy. He's like wrapped in a blanket. But he's got a he's got a big old puffy head, and his eyes are giant. And, and he's looks like he's you know he's got jowls. Just he's got for days. he's got uh, jowls, mustache? and he he looks like somebody that's gonna go <laughs> when he talks. <laughs> that's the perfect description. Who's yep. that? There's I feel like there's a Disney villain that looks just like this. Mm. Oh, he looks. You know who he looks like? 
that alien that sells the pod racers in, in Star Wars. <laughs> If, if you can imagine that guy's face with a big amorphous robe below it, that's kind of what this looks yep. like. Okay. But give him a big full head of bushy hair. Yep. Yep. And that's this guy. Okay. So he wanted to depict this author in the moment of conceiving a work. Okay. Right. So brave, looking into the distance, in the passion of creativity. And so we put him in kind of like a bathrobe in his house, yeah. which is where someone would maybe come up with a work. This was not what the people who commissioned it had in mind. And this was never cast until after his death. That's hilarious. They didn't actually cast this thing. And here is one of my favorite quotes from a critic about it. There may come a time, and doubtless will come a time, when it will not seem outre to represent a great novelist as a huge comic mask crowning a bathrobe. Thank you. But even at the present day, this statue impresses one as slang and i like it's wow. just scathing commentary i love it but it's kind of what it looks like it's yeah. a big amorphous dude in a robe with blah, blah, jowls. <laughs> does not seem like his best i it's not my favorite no okay one more super influential one is called the walking man that okay. should be your next link yeah don't know what i expected it's a the walking man okay can you describe this? It's, it's a man in a blue shirt holding a camera. That was really funny. Oh, I'm sorry. There's okay. a guy in the background. There's a guy in the background. background. So, so it's a body walking. There are no arms. There's no head. So it's the torso and the legs. And now I'm trying to see if he's walking the right way. His back heel doesn't seem to be up. Okay. So this is, it looks like it's in the Impressionist Museum. I didn't actually look where it was located, but judging by the paintings in the background, this mm-hmm. would be in Paris at the Impressionist, Muse- Impressionist Museum. And the way that this was completed was odd because the upper torso and the lower legs are not even from the same sculpture initially. The torso was one that had been abandoned in his workshop and was falling into disrepair that he found one day. Yeah. The lower half is from the, a version of John the Baptist preaching that he was mm. having done at reduced scale. So he was shrinking it down a little bit. That makes sense. He took the two and basically welded them together. And didn't even try to hide the joint. Look at the thing in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, like even the color between the torso and the legs is different. Like they just, they they appear very clearly not to have gone together. Yeah. And there's no head on it. There are no arms. It seems abused and falling to pieces. Now, can you, can you make this jive with the artistry present in that bust that I showed you earlier? Which bust? Like the bust of his teacher. Yeah, you're right. This looks, this looks like. This looks like a hack job. This looks like a hack job. This looks a lot more rugged. This doesn't look polished. Was he mad? Did he not want to do this? No, No. he's, he's kind of leaning into an impressionism that he kind of gets in his future years, right? He, he becomes more obsessed rather with the classicism of representing something sort of as accurately as possible, which was kind of a trend at the time. They were becoming commodities, like these little pieces. You mm-hmm. can have sculptures reprodu- mass produced. Like there's one of a, it's called, I think it's called, called the Little Prince or the Princeling. And it's a kid with a dog and it became like mass produced a ton. And he's sort of reacting against that mm-hmm. and instead wanting to focus on human emotion, human drama, and pure form as opposed to linking it to any previous story, mm-hmm. right? The classical the way to to sculpt classically is to reference some backstory, right? To reference either Achilles or to reference one of the Greek gods or a story that's relatively famous. That is one of the ways that you draw meaning into the piece. For him, it was about pure human emotion, pure form. And so he's trying to resist drawing in the past, Mm -hmm. right? Does that make you guys cranky or no? Yeah. Yeah. That all sounds very nice. It's a very goofy looking, um, sculpture nonetheless right but it still has this like weird hopeless passion to it i don't know it does have a hopeless passion to it probably because he doesn't have a head (laughs) 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 and the body's like falling apart Uh, sure yeah Yeah. so i don't know i i have a hard time figuring out how i feel about this piece i think i think like what what's that poem the the wasteland Mm -hmm. like the wasteland Mm -hmm. it is the the excellent first thing that spawned a thousand bad reproductions right he is not this again. Well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to fall into this, but he's one of the first, right? Mm-hmm. He, he pushed into this when nobody else was. Mm. And that's why he had such a hard time with the critics and, and sort of sorts of things. And it will have a pretty big influence on the gates of hell as he is later okay. to produce them. Okay. Right. Okay. So that kind of deconstructed human form. He's one of the first people who's doing it. Is what you're saying. As far Whereas as I everybody is striving for the like Hellenized ideal. Yeah, he's, exactly. Gotcha. 
And remember, audience and my two gentlemen here, I was not educated in art history. You are. I no, have very little background you, you in this. You are claiming expertise and that we should take everything you say at face value. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what I'm saying is if you're interested in this audience, you better do your do, own do research because I'm, yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm learning this and you are learning with me is what's <laughs> happening. Okay. His method was pretty crazy. He didn't have his, his models sit. He had them move up, like get up and move around in the workshop, even if they were naked, just get up and start moving. And he would sort of bang out a rough sculpture in 15 minutes wow. and then would work to give it the human qualities mm-hmm. that he wanted to give it. And that was from someone that I think it was George Bernard Shaw sat down right. and had a bust made. And he's like, it took 15 minutes and he w- it was the, the basics were there. And then he Crazy. would sort of hand these off to his his little sculpture minions, and they would recreate a larger version of it to be cast. Oh, okay. so that was that was part of the way that he worked, right? So make the sculpture and then blow it up by having mm-hmm. minions do it, which seems not okay to us. We're like, an artist must feel every piece of the art. Right. But that's actually pretty classical. Um, many art, great artists had giant workshops mm-hmm. that would be re- reproducing paintings for them and, sure. and helping with the art. Graham, AJ, before we go any further, I want to thank our Patreon sponsors for making this episode possible. Uh, Our Patreon sponsors support us at one of four levels. I'm going to go through them right now because I think many people listening, they want to be a part of this as well. They want to become patrons as well. Uh, We have a $2 a month tier. Those are Ghibellines at $2 a month. You get access to all of our episodes ad-free. You also get access to previous uh, uh, content that we've done mostly at uh, conferences, um, so you get ap- uh, access to many other uh, bonus episodes as well. At $10 a month, you get access to our our uh, in-between episodes, which we record after every single episode that we record. You also get access to our monthly AMAs, which I think are really funny, and some of our best content. In addition to all the same benefits at the $2 a month tier, you get access to ad-free episodes. Above that, at the $20 a month tier, you... Uh, at that point are giving input into the podcast. You are helping us come up with future topics to come up with future merchandise in addition to all benefits from the tiers below that. And finally, and you heard about this uh, in recent episodes, we have added a Helios's acolytes of love tier at $100 a month at this level. You are a true believer and you are the most faithful of our listeners at this tier. You get all the benefits from lower tiers. You also get I can't believe I'm saying these words that you get a Helios acolytes of love crew neck sweatshirt. You get Helios acolytes of love Crocs and you get uh, a free uh, copy of all future merchandise as we create it. So incredible, incredible benefits at this, at this level that is only for $100 a month. You can find all of this at patreoncom slash classical stuff. Thanks again to our patrons and um, thank you all for listening. I was wondering that earlier about the um, art, whoever his first boss was, who was like copying art over and over again, if that was like a, a respected profession or if that's like making it trash. But apparently he's a respected yeah, guy, I mean, right? For went what okay. Did. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the gates of hell. I okay. think let's do it. you have one image there. The, the first image at the top is not the best one. And then you have a second image that, that you can blow up real big is white. Hmm? You see the white, Aren't they both? the white version. Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. So there's a black version. That's the first one. That's that one's in bronze. Yes. Mm. And then you have a white one, which is pure plaster. Uh-huh. Oh, and the then you have a, one. another really big one in black. Yes, I think I got that. Okay, the really big one in black is probably where we spend most of our time. These are actually different versions in different places. Like I said, there are a bunch of different castings of this. Uh, one of them is in the Auguste Rodin Museum in Paris, and this is where I saw the the cast version firsthand. Okay. Right? So the cast versions are more complete, even though they are later versions. There are some sad things happening in this door. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you don't feel a little bit of despair there, you're doing it wrong. Okay, so he he worked on this again for a very, very long time, and he would consistently add figures, remove figures, play around with groupings, change them, move them, copy them. In fact, many of the figures appear multiple times in the door, right? If you're looking, you will find one where two people that are clearly look like they're supposed to be together joined, and then he will separate them, replicate them, and stick them in other places hmm. in the door. I will try to show you a couple places like that. Okay. Um, does one of you... Oh, sorry. The, the white one is from the Musée d'Orsay. It's the original. That's the plaster one. And that's the one that he worked on till way later in his life. But if you actually go and look at it, it feels less complete. It's missing some of the figures Mm, that he had taken off and been fiddling with. 
right? So if you want to see the original, I think it's the original, go to the Musée d'Orsay. And then if you want to see a more full, complete casting, go see one of the other ones. I The one in the, muse, the Rodin Museum is just arresting. And the extra bonus is that it's about 40 feet from The Thinker, a really <laughs> large casting of The Thinker. It's cool. Okay. So, Fingers in the door, too. Okay. Yeah. So let's yes. let's uh, do a quick description of the door. What do you guys see? Giant door with lots of figures. It's chaotic. Um, there's motion all over the thing. Well, I guess start from the top. There are three people at the top looking sad. Mm-hmm. Heads down. They're all then, like doing a power punch together. They look yes. like they're doing a fist bump. Yes. But like a sad fist bump. Okay. And, they're, and their heads are bonking each other. So that, how would you... They're, they're standing above the door. Yes. Like yes. on the top of it. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. Okay, then what comes after that? If you, I mean, um, little people, uh, what, like just beneath their feet, aren't those are those people? Over those down are there? tiny heads, oh, like faces that are in despair. You can zoom in and kind of see them. Okay, just a bunch of little tiny people, um, almost like little gargoyles in the door. Everywhere you look, like in every corner, there's like a crouching sad person, or there's like a body twisted and contorted. If you look at the two two corners, the top left corner and the top right corner. The top left corner has got like what looks like a man or a woman trying to hide in the corner of the door, holding, clutching their knees. And then on the other side, it looks like there's a woman like trying to hold or hug on to somebody and you just see her back. Oh, so on the on the outside of on the, the door. outside of the doors, the general organization is that as opposed to the gates of paradise, which are. A bunch of panels, really well ordered. I think it's what sixteen panels. Yeah, this is just a big. No, it's ten panels. Oh, is that it? Because it ten. Oh, that was ten. Aren't they four rows of seven? Isn't it twenty? Is it not the twenty? That was the really big one. Oh, oh, sorry. The okay, so okay. this is just a big blob it's of people. 10. Yes, you're yeah. Right. He originally had had this divided into eight panels mm-hmm. in kind of a response to the gates of of paradise, but he found that as he messed with the figures, he just wanted more blank space to play with, and so. What you have is a, a very large tympanum up top. It's it's something that would go above the door. Mm-hmm. We generally don't see these, but if you have one in your house, it might be like uh, the window above your front door, right? That's gotcha. kind of what it might look like. And then you have two giant doors, and mm-hmm. then two, and they're just big blank panels. Well, not blank, but they're big panels. And then to the left and right are these giant columns that are also covered with people. And al- almost every surface, there are people, there are mm-hmm. figures, there's stuff going down, right? Okay, so you you noted the the like jumble of heads right above the tympanum. Yes, and a a couple. Oh, of, I didn't even see those. Oh, aren't oh. those cool? Yeah. So <laughs> heads everywhere. This sculpture is eighteen feet high. Okay. Jeez. Twelve feet wide and three feet deep. Oh, that's wow. the one that amazes me. Is that it's three feet deep? Sure. The picture you are seeing can give no real sense of the depth, sense right. of how powerful this sculpture mm-hmm. is as it stands in front of you. Those. The, a lot of those things, the people, the images, the like falling man come straight out of the sculpture at you. You right. could grab them like a handle. And and it, so it's it's just big and it took an incredible amount of bronze to cast. Right. There are 180 figures <laughs> in this in this door. They're everywhere. Yeah. No one's having a good time. And no. nobody's having a good time. Okay, so we talked about the three guys up top. Do you notice that there's a gap under their feet? Yes, there's like, it looks like the, the door kind of, busted okay what used to be there was a reference from dante's inferno those three shades used to be which is what they're called the three shades and they are reproduced again later uh used to be staring down at the sign that said abandon all hope ye who enter here Mm, so that reference has been where did the sign go ripped off oh Hmm. Right, he, he, I, Rodan took it off. It was a, it was a choice. Okay. Oh, uh, they're saying like some dude stole, stole it. It's like it. in his yeah, dorm the, room. Or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got it, bros. It's, a, it's an it's original like a, Rodan. Yeah. Uh, he. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> it's a Rodan. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> he he took it off because he he originally conceived of this door as being heavily referential to Dante. Dante's Inferno. Yeah. But as he played with the figures. Again, what I told you about him kind of separating himself from the classical tradition and wanting to focus more on human form and feeling, mm-hmm. he said, well, my, my ima- you know, his imagination just sort of ran away with him and he started doing figures of his own rather than figures strictly from, from the story. From, from the story. Mm-hmm. There are still a few figures from the story left and I'll, and I'll note them. Can you tell me what's happening in the tympanum? Um, so there's like a... There's a uh, thinker in the middle. Is that, is that the right part? Yeah, so no, that's, oh, that's the tip of, okay. That's the thinker. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. if you're thinking of the statue, the thinker, he is present in this door, yep. sitting on the top of it, staring down. Staring down. If you had to take a guess at why was that was there, what's going on there? Is this 
Why is there a guy thinking at the top of hell? I thought it'd be limbo or not limbo. What's it called? The place where the virtuous pagans go. Yeah, but what's going on? But all around him, that does not seem to be people having fun. They are not having fun. There, it looks like there are people getting sorted. Was that um? Chir- no, who's the boat person? Is it Chiron, uh, Karen. Karen. That's Karen. Not, no, that's not Karen. <laughs> Karen the boatman. Karen. Um, Carol. So um, I don't know why the thinker's there. So this is, yes, a little bit referential to the final judgment by Michelangelo. Mm-hmm. Remember I told you Michelangelo had a pretty big mm. influence on his, on his sculpting, and mm-hmm. one of the things that he most affected him was the last judgment, which is the painting on the wall of the Sistine Chapel. We actually did an episode on it a long time ago if you want to go searching for it. It's awesome. The whole left side of it are people being Torn, raised. Yeah, yeah. The whole right side are people being condemned. Right. Mm-hmm. This kind of references that, but not entirely. And what you have here are people waiting to head down to death, mm. looking at their you know future punishment. None of them are really having a good time, but this is kind of the, uh, looks like the waiting room. And at the top, what you have in the thinker is Dante. Oh. He's wearing the, the signature Dante's poet's hat. Hmm. So it references Dante. What? Yeah, if, not. You, if you look in, look at that funny little blob on the side of his head. I can tell he doesn't have hair, but I can't tell that he has a hat. Uh, Poets get hats? I think, yeah, I think he's got the hat. Hmm. And then it's also supposed to partially represent Rodin himself, right? Okay. It is mm, the sure. thing c- contemplating the work he is about to create. Yeah. Gotcha. Right? Okay. What is happening below that? Oh, the guy who's coming out of the door do you mean that or there's one guy trying to get out out you, the door or do you <laughs> climbing. mean climbing climbing out oh, the, he is climbing up isn't he um there's people looks like they're falling or tumbling into hell mm-hmm. there's bodies everywhere there's like one girl off to the left who looks like she's posing and she's got like a little platform to stand on where's that around the far left of the door top left corner so, oh like the top left second. corner Sorry. like that I don't know what's what's going on with her. Yeah, she looks like she's she's looks like sassy, just rocking Beyonce. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the three shades look like they're in the middle of that Beyonce dance. But, mm-hmm. oh, 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 oh. <laughs> You've ruined it. Okay, um, sorry. <laughs> now, yeah, so it looks like they are all these people are tumbling down into hell, down sort of almost like the, the f- side of a cliff or the side of a of a rock face. Yeah, and it all looks like they're kind of enveloped in either lava yeah, or yeah, blackness fire. or mm-hmm. darkness, something. Something kind of wild and turbulent there, right. mm-hmm. which, again, you don't get really get the feeling of the depth and the motion that's actually in the piece from mm-hmm. this picture, but it's there. Right. Okay. Anything else notable you see? There's one falling man that's kind in of coming out of there, right in the middle. Um, let's see. Further down you go. Oh, I, there's no little demons dragging them down. You would think there would be little demons with, like, hooks and stuff. I've been, there aren't. It's mostly just sad just people. people. Yeah, right? yeah. And then is that some kind of, like, cloth at the bottom? Uh, mm-hmm. Looks like it. It's just hard to separate it all. Like, they just, they're just, like, tons of people on top of each other falling down this... It's like just a tumbling darkness. mass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you just get this tumbling mass of people having a really, really bad time yes um those the figures in this part of the door are generally more fully formed than those on either column in the columns if you note they are only barely set in relief like they Mm -hmm. look like they're frozen deeper into hell yes right Mm -hmm. they're less turbulent in fact if you look at the far low right on the on the column do you note something about those two people they look like they're about to kiss each other yeah so one thing that he conceived of in is that paolo and francesca there are many references to Paolo and Francesca. We'll get there in a okay. second. So he, one thing he thought of about hell was that they are finally allowed to basically enjoy their torment in peace. There's no more God to tell them what's right and wrong. And so he actually, he originally had a lot more amorous characters in here, but he felt that thematically they didn't really fit. Right. Right. Making out in hell doesn't really give the overall feeling of hell. And so he had a few of those in there. Yeah. So let's go a few, go through a few of the notable figures. So first, and I sent you pictures of these, is... Oh, there was one more picture of people sitting in front of it to give you a feeling of how big it was. Are you serious? We're 50 minutes in already? Oh, yeah. Holy cats. I didn't even think I had enough for a whole thing. All right, so what do we do? Um, you tell me. Keep trucking. Okay, here. I'll just do a few of the figures. I'll hit, I'll hit the important highlights, and then we'll... Uh, you can we'll, do a two-parter if you want. We'll call it good. Oh, I don't have enough for a two-parter. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll just call it good. There's only a few we can go long important figures you need to know. Okay. Okay, one of the first ones, we talked about the thinker, representative of Dante. Mm-hmm. The next one is called The Kiss. This was originally a part of the door and is now no longer a part of the door, but might be, mm, honestly, 
one of the most famous Rodin sculptures there is. They're supposed to be in hell? They were in hell. He took them out because they didn't fit. Right? This is Francesca and Paolo. Do either of you know the story of Francesca and Paolo? Mm, she was married. He read a sexy book to her. Something like that. Yeah. That's all so I you, uh, Lancelot and wasn't it King Arthur? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You meet them in the second ring of hell in Dante's Inferno, and they're being blown around in the the wind, and they've they've been reproduced again and again and again and again in classical art. And what what happened was they she had been married at a very young age to this older kind of dumb guy for the sake of politics. Oh. And she fell in love with his younger brother. Mm -hmm. And so they're sitting together one day and they're reading Lancelot and Guinevere, which for the time was a very sexy book. And they would read it and they would pause and sort of look at each other, make eyes. Then they would read and pause. And then eventually she dropped the book and they started kissing. Turns out husband was hiding behind a tapestry, found him, stabbed them both. Yep. Right. So they end up in hell in the circle of the lustful and it's kind of implied in Dante that they don't really like each other that much, right? They're kind of stuck together. They, I mean, they just had kind of a moment of passion, but they're not suited for each other. Right. Yeah. So he, again, he references them a ton in this. And one of the most Im- more important groups, if you look back at the door, I don't know if you can sort through all the pictures, but on the lower left, mm-hmm. you have two figures kind of being blown. You see the dude's yep. bum kind of towards you and the girl mm. kind of tackling him. Mm-hmm. That's Francesca and Paolo being blown about by the wind. Okay. And then I think that that kissing couple in the far lower right was also probably the same thing. Gotcha. Okay. So then up next, we have Count Ugolino and his children. That dude is Ugolino. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So are, you're probably looking at the Carpo. It's, is it lifelike? Yeah. And very yes. accurate? Yes. yes. Okay. So you're looking at Carpo's version of Count Ugolino. Mm. Again, it was a figure that was done again and again in classical sculpture and stories. And do you know the story of Count Ugolino? Do not. But he's got a bunch of needy people. So he, I, I have to do it quick. I was going to actually read the passage to you, but you meet him in the bottom of hell. He is mm. frozen into the the lake at the bottom of hell, and he's chewing a guy's skull all to pieces. And it's because he and this other guy, Ruggieri, kind of conspired to take over the government, Mm -hmm. and he did, and then Ruggieri flipped on him and imprisoned him in a tower and then nailed the door shut, him and his kids. And so he had to watch his kids starve to death and then starve to death himself. And as they were dying, they said, like, we're going to die. You might as well eat us. And he did. And so this is his, he gets to get revenge on Ruggieri by chomping his brains all up, but right. he's still in hell himself for, you know, a, betraying his country. Right. So this is him being gnawed with hunger, trying to resist eating his children in Capo's, Carpo's. And then in the Dante, ver, in the Rodin right. version, yeah. he is there crawling over his dead children. Mm. And Ugh. you find that in the left panel of the door. He actually is one of the figures in the door. So those are the two main classical references, those two guys. Uh, the figures at the top, the three shades are also reproduced. Those were originally one figure, Adam. Mm. And so Hmm. he has produced them separately. He blew up one of the figures, called it Adam, and then he's blown the three of them up together and called them the three shades. You also see one called meditation, one called fleeting love, which is people being blown around. Another reference to Francesca and Paolo. One called I am beautiful, where it's this guy lifting a bald up woman and they actually show up twice in the door. So one is where the guy's lifting the woman. Mm-hmm. One is where they're separated. He looks like he's just kind of in pain. And then she looks balled up in a corner somewhere. Mm-hmm. So he used the figures twice. And then there's a few other ones that are kind of notable. But those are the biggest ones, right? The Kiss, Francesca and Paolo, and Count Ugolino, and The Thinker, along with the three shades up top. So notice that you kind of get stripped of all referent points. Mm-hmm as he moves into sort of capturing human passion. Sure. And the sculpture is just arresting. Like, mm-hmm. you, you, I would stand in front of it as long as I could possibly stand every time we go visit because it just takes so much attention, right? He, ca- he captures the feeling of it. Is it still the doors to an art museum? Isn't that what you said it was for originally? It was intended for that, and I oh. think it was actually intended for the museum where the Musée d'Orsay now is, right. but the door doesn't open. Oh, the, 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 really? <laughs> no, it's a giant block of bronze or plaster, sure, depending yeah. on where you go. Sure. And it's because the, the figures are so entangled in it. And one of the videos right. I watched in preparing for this episode, she said, the door doesn't open <laughs> because the figures are so entangled and there's no opening mechanism. <laughs> so basically, he just made it so it couldn't open. Sure. That's the story there. It's quite a bold What's take on What's the doors? story of the bald up girl, the woman being carried by the man? I don't know. No. I don't even know why he called it I Am Beautiful. 
Yeah, it's crazy. But it's really good. But that is, yeah. So that's the story of the gates of hell. It's awesome. You should go see it. So um, I guess what's the big takeaway? Like why you say he's writing it or he's making it in response to the gates of paradise. Yeah. But you were, but he doesn't, he's, but yeah, he's, he's abandoning the classical stories of hell. Moving away from it. So I guess, Mm -hmm. I guess maybe the thing to remember is that you are capturing this moment where you are still connected to the Western canon and to classicism. But at the moment when people are starting to walk away from it, you can't look at this without it being in conversation with the Gates of Paradise that I referenced a few episodes ago. Yeah. But you also can't look at it as a purely classical piece because it's not. The thinker is not only Dante, it's also Rodin and it's also Prometheus and it's also a random human figure. It is all those things. He stripped the reference points so yeah. that it could be all those things. I guess the big takeaway for me as I look at it is for Rodin, hell is a very emotional experience which duh Mm -hmm. but what is (laughs) stripped from it is like any kind of sense of it being part of justice or a part of a whole or part of god's condemnation like like it it sort of looks like he's thinking he's conceiving of hell almost psychologically as opposed to cosmically Hmm. because the gates of paradise are um and even just classical references to hell heaven and purgatory from dante are placing them in a cosmology, whereas this, he's, it's... It's, it's about to, the sufferers. It's about sufferers and, yeah. and, and... What they're going through. Yeah. So there's... Um, but not why. Yeah, not why, and also there's, you don't have the people that... Uh, yeah, so you don't have the demons. You don't have the demons who are torturing them. You don't have the jail, the, the gatekeepers. You don't have the people who are like, sorry, man, like the, the paper says you're in hell. You got to go there. It's not part of a structure. He doesn't have the... I don't know, the bureaucracy of hell is the wrong way. But yeah, it doesn't have the structure, doesn't have the the, the figures that are fitting into it. Um, but in that way, he almost stumbles into a meaning that I think is part of hell, and Dante even references in, in Dante's Inferno, right? They, they can see the future, but their past is falling away from their memories, and they don't know the present. And so the moment that the world ends, they will know nothing forever. He talks about how hell is almost the oblivion of meaning. Hmm. Uh, that's so he has kind of accidentally reinforced a meaning that is in hell in some other uh, several other places like even in milton right they can kind of make what they want of hell yeah they can like they but they do intramurals and sports and stuff yeah no, seriously they do really? they do yeah. but they're they are trying to make meaning in a place that is meaningless yeah. they are attempting to resurrect some sense of bureaucracy when the bureaucracy has been blasted to hell by god Mm -hmm. so i find that that sort of stumbling into reinforcing a meaning that's present in the ancients is kind of fun Hmm. interesting cool good all right anything else on that no that's it thanks i'm sorry for talking and not talking to you guys much it was awesome no it was really great yeah again for this one make you'll probably want to head to youtube or just google along as you listen so thank you all for being here this has been classical stuff you should know you can find us online at classicalstuff.net. you can find us on twitter at classical stuff you can find us on Patreon, patreon.com slash classical stuff. You can email us, the guys at classical stuff.net. And I think that's all we have for today. So for Graham, AJ, Thomas, um, this is us signing off. Thanks, signing everyone. Signing off. Ciao. Bye. Bye.